Hello, everybody. Welcome to this session. I'm going to wait so I can see there's quite a few people joining, but I want to be sure that everybody's aware that this is being recorded and I will try to remember to remind people of that before we come to questions so that you can decide if you want to put your camera on and so on, but it will be recorded. So welcome to everybody. And I'm absolutely delighted that we you, you're able to make time in the afternoon of everyone's busy Mondays. I'm Coral Hill. I'm the founder of Legal Women magazine. And today Legal Women has partnered with Hill Dickinson to celebrate International Women's Day. I'm celebrating it slightly early. It's actually Wednesday is the official day when a lot of stuff happens, but people pretty much have events going through throughout March. I'm going to start with a few introductions. Um, and uh, I would also like to say thanks to Hill Dickinson and uh, Catherine Dunn, who's not on screen, but really appreciate the time you've given to this, Catherine. It's fantastic. We've got three panel members that you can see in addition to myself on screen, and I'll introduce each of them to you in the order that they're going to speak. So first of all, Jane Emma Power. Jane has worked extensively in equality, diversity and inclusion issues. She's a business consultant who works in partnership with companies and through coaching and mentoring develops leadership qualities and capabilities. Jane is also a senior HR lecturer at Liverpool John Moores University and sits as a panel member for employment tribunals. I'll turn next to Jonathan Andrews. Uh, I was particularly keen to have a man on the panel, as I think that sometimes the role of male allies and champions is overlooked in promoting gender parity. So I'm really delighted that we were able to get somebody who I know has been active in this. And Jonathan is an assistant solicitor, associate solicitor, sorry, at Reed Smith. He's a council member for the Law Society of England and Wales, and for six years was a member of its Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. In 2020, the Shaw Trust Power List identified Jonathan as Britain's fourth most influential disabled person. He's worked on numerous diversity initiatives, including uh, with government advisory groups, and he's been an advocate both nationally and internationally, speaking at the UN, OECD, Council of Europe, amongst other bodies. And the third person I'm delighted to introduce is Leslie Wan, who's from the FBN Bank UK Limited, where Leslie is general counsel. Leslie also sits on an advisory board of the Law Society of England and Wales, and that's regarding in-house council matters. She's the founder of two distinctive groups, one a charity called Through the Looking Glass, which aims to advise young people in acquiring skills and so on through education and other activities so that they can participate fully in society. Leslie also founded the Eagle Club, which is a private initiative for women in senior leadership positions. It enables an effective network and is also designed to build confidence, share challenges, ideas and know how to support the next generation. So thank you very much to all three of you. We're going to be talking today about the theme for this year, which is hashtag Embrace Equity. And I'm going to ask Jane to start by giving us an overview of your perspective and particularly covering the difference between equality and equity. So Jane, thank you. Thank you, Coral. I'm just going to share screen. So just bear with me whilst uh, we just use the technology. And hopefully it should be voila. Two seconds. <laughs> Great, you can see it. Thank you so much. I'm just waiting for it to appear on my end. There we go. I can I can see that too now. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to come along and 
um, speak with you this afternoon on the topic, the topic, sorry, of um, embrace um, equity. When um, I was asked to do this presentation, I did have a look at the UN theme around embrace equality, and I would be honest and say that actually I was met with, um, I suppose, a barrage of images um, that we've probably seen in lots of various guises. I think the most common one is those three images where you see what equality is and there's three people, then what diversity is and what inclusion is. And um, having looked at that, I was thinking that kind of denoted for me um, kind of a low level awareness around equality. And then I was thinking from a gender perspective, we have an understanding from self around what equality, diversity, inclusion um, and belonging is. So I thought I'm going to pitch it at a, a little higher um, so that actually we can we can look at self. So I'm clearly not going to read through um, these definitions because my view is that we um, have a good level of understanding um, from an everyday perspective um, of this language. However, um, how often are we given the opportunity to have a look at these definitions, to just stop, reflect and consider how we see them applied in the workplace? We see that organisations um, now are fully versed in terms of um, preparing um, EDIB statements, that they are fully versed in developing a range of policies and they promote their policies through lots of various and differing means, but actually they also like to place these statements um, onto their, their website. When we see those statements, I think we look at them and we may find some comfort in those statements and say, yeah, this is an organisation that I would uh, maybe like to work for or I'm interested and um, or curious. But what I'd really like to focus on is that that equity and belonging piece. And what does what does that mean for us in terms of um, organisations? So let me turn that over. So, as I say, this is what we are likely to see in, or, in organisations, that they um, create scope to recognise different categories of people. They will evidence their equity piece via um, policies, procedures and practices that they will put in place. Um, they will then advertise that around um, their uh, web page and other sources as a way of, of demonstrating how they are including people. Um, but I do have a question mark around this final piece, which is titled Justice Here, but can be transposed to read um, belonging. And for me, that's the real space where the action takes place because it gives an opportunity for individuals to focus on self. So how do individuals or how are individuals able to see themselves in the workplace? How are they able to see how they are included in, in the workplace? How is it via their individual interactions with colleagues, peers, managers and senior leaders in an organisation? that they're able to um, see self. And um, I, th there are lots of models out there in terms of how organisations attempt um, to do this, um, but I've always been quite struck by um, a little model that's um, presented by um, Deloitte. And so when they talk about inclusion, um, when looking um, through a, a, an EDIB lens, they talk about the equity piece in terms of fairness and respect. And that's a way in which we're able to see um, equity. So the way in which an organisation is able to demonstrate fairness and respect to us. They then talk about that value and belonging piece. And so again, in terms of equity and belonging, how do organisations facilitate individuals in order to bring in their own uh, unique and authentic self 
into the workplace? How is that evidenced in an organisation? And then when they, they talk about um, safety and, and openness, they're talking about, well, how does an organisation um, support individuals so that they're able to speak up and to speak without fear or without embarrassment or without retaliation for using their voice in the workplace. And having those three key elements in place in terms of equity and belonging should then lead us to this empowered and growing organisation. And I'm sure, like me, you've seen some of the studies that have said that, you know, if you have in place a workforce where, I'm, I'm sorry, if you have in place a workforce where equity, um, inclusion and belonging are at the core of the organisation, i.e. part of your DNA, then it is in that space then that you're more likely to see a growth in performance and a growth in um, profits and or excellent services at the end of the day. So just in line with my um, quick introduction, I just wanted to leave um, with this little slide. Uh, I don't know if you're a fan of uh, Brené Brown, I am. And I just, I found this and thought, you know what, this is very fitting for today, and very fitting in terms of thinking of ways in which we as individuals embrace equity and belonging for self, but also equity and belonging from an organisation perspective. So I'd just like to leave you with that little quote from Brené Brown. Thank you, um, Coral. I'll take down these slides now. Thank you so much, Jane. That, that was a really fantastic um, uh, start to the discussion. And, and I, I agree with you. The website is very, um, the uh, for the IWD theme, is very much the, those um, images that we've all seen. So I yeah. think it's quite helpful to take that a little bit further. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, I'll turn to John. We will have questions if people are, have questions. You're welcome to write them in the chat box, but I'll do all the questions at the end um, when you'll have the opportunity either to ask them yourselves or, or if they're in the chat box, we'll try and pick them up. But I'll go now to um, uh, to Jonathan and uh, just it would be useful to have your perspective on the theme of embrace equity and what it means to be a male ally, ally and how that works in practice. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Coral, and uh, thank you for every, everyone for being here to mark um, and celebrate International Women's Day, uh, which obviously is uh, an incredibly important event in the, the calendar. Uh, in, in terms of um, sort of embracing equity, as Coral mentioned, I've been um, involved in, in diversity and inclusion and equity and equality. Um, um, activities and 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 campaigning and and advocacy really for for some time now and um, I remember meeting Coral um, quite a few years ago now when I was a, a, a law student and and um, really passionate about making um, changes in this area uh, and a lot of the focus um, has been on various different aspects. Personally, I am on the autistic spectrum and uh, I'm also um, LGBT and so um and also would will come from what would be described as non-traditional social backgrounds coming into sort of city law so uh, a lot of sort of you know personal experience has come from um has come from this and a lot of the advocacy that i've done in terms of personal experience sort of focuses on this but i think it's important that when we look at um um equity uh, and we embrace that that actually we recognize that you know there are various um different people uh, of different identities and backgrounds throughout society who are um, held, maybe held back. Um, maybe there are barriers in the way that even if they've managed to overcome, there are still additional barriers um, in, compared to others in society. And that is very much true uh, of um, women in the, the workplace and certainly has been throughout history as much and, and indeed in broader society as it as, as it would be. Um, more widely within the uh, equity um, discussion. And so I was really honoured to be asked uh, to, to be on this panel. It's, um, it, it's uh, uh, although I obviously, as Coral says, I, I advocate generally for 
um, the in inclusion and e equity. Um, and I have been uh, involved previously in events uh, for law firms, including um, women in law um, networking events that have been put on because I think it's important to have a male pers perspective and, and support. Um, in terms of how sort of the male voice, I suppose, can play a role in that, I think that so a lot of the time um, men can often feel that actually the conversation isn't for us, um, obviously, because when it's talking about um, International Women's Day or um, women's empowerment or removing barriers for women, obviously um, men are not necessarily directly affected um, by those, um, although they may well be affected by a lot of uh, barriers that actually stretch broader and do impact on people, which I will sort of touch on later. Um, but even if you're not directly impacted by something, I think it's still important to be able to sort of speak um, as an ally for for people. But it's important to sort of know the uh, how to do that as an ally. I think lots of people sort of shy away from talking at all or from trying to take on that position because they're worried that they don't know what, what how to do it right or that they may sort of um, overpower or 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 have views where it's not appropriate to have those. But actually, I find listening as important as talking as an ally. So um, it, it actually understanding what is it that you can do that will help um, women in, in certain positions and and or to you know combat discrimination or 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 barriers or to help them advance or whatever it is. Um, and actually to then act in the way that you know people would like you to and it could be a case of um when people and, and met you know um men come across as much as women people make inappropriate comments sort of in, in in an appropriate way um calling out or otherwise dealing with that and making it clear that you as men um don't find that appropriate either and and not, you know don't don't find sort of comments of that um of that nature appropriate which is certainly you know how I would feel um if there was say a sexist comment for example or, or any other sort of um comment that uh, suggested that um, women were less worth less or or, or fitting with those stereotypes so I think I think sort of being able to use your voice in that way to support others is really important and it's doing that as an ally um and not overpowering obviously because that is a genuine concern but there are ways of advocating and showing support without doing that. And obviously, um, as somebody who comes from other marginalised um, backgrounds and and, uh, and other um, you know diverse backgrounds, uh, you would hope others would be allies for you as well. And obviously, the best way I say of doing that is to is to make the effort to show allyship for others as well. Um, in terms of a broader discussion around gender as well, I mean a lot of the you know issues that maybe people might say are women's issues in the workplace you know it might be actually things that do impact it might be um parental leave for example which obviously if we are talking about maybe more equitable um or uh, more sort of individual where couples can um think about that and work that as, as they wish a way of parenting actually um men often will be involved in that and should be and so actually there is a, a purpose in having you know a men's voice in that discussion um and promoting um that maybe you know that it hasn't got to be one way that people um can sort of do that in the way that they wish and that there should be support for that um and it might also be things like flexible working for example you know it may often come up in the context of um child care for example for working mothers um but actually, flexible working is, as, as someone who's very involved with disability advocacy, flexible working is something that dis um, disability advocacy also focuses on an awful lot in terms of actually people maybe not being able to commute um, or at least not being able to commute, you know, five or four or three days a week, whatever, you know, whatever it may be um, due to maybe fatigue or dis certain physical disabilities. But actually, you know, by working in a more flexible way and filling things around Sort of you know other requirements that they have are still able to contribute in a way that's just as equal as anybody else but just in that different way that takes that into um, into account and so a lot of things that people may instinctively think oh it doesn't apply to me 
actually may well do um, or may well apply to a, a greater um, variety of, of people and wider number. And so there are lots of issues which, you know, people may assume only, only sort of affect one group and actually affect more. And so that's why it is really important to have that allyship, um, whether it's male allies, whether it's people who maybe experience uh, other forms of diversity or marginalisation, that actually speaking up, um, speaking maybe where there are similarities in terms of the barriers that may be faced by people um, and other groups and working together on that. Um, but ultimately, doing that, being good allies for each other and really um, supporting uh, initiatives to drive um, equity and obviously the inclusion um, where we can. Um, and so that's why obviously I'm I'm very pleased to be able to champion as many events of this nature as I can and um, very pleased to be asked to speak here on this panel today. Thank you, Carl. Super. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And we'll we'll come back to that issue because I'd be particularly interested to hear from the audience, actually, whether they've got examples of where mm. um, it's helped or where it hasn't and so on. And I, I, I've got my own examples. So, Le Leslie, if we could turn to you, please, um, about your perspective on the theme of Embrace Equity. And in particular, um, having had the um, theme set out by Jane, I was hoping you could say a little bit about how to embed these ideas in the workplace. Thank you. Thanks, Coral. Hi, everyone. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me um, to join this esteemed panel today. I've really enjoyed listening to um, Jane and um, the talk by Jonathan just now, I just wanted to say I reiterate and support Jonathan's point about including men in your um, processes and your committees and your ideas, because um, I think it's, it's, it's fundamental to bring men to the table, because we women look at things in a different way, and men look at things in a different way. And sometimes you know, they do not join up and it's just a misunderstanding or just um, just a, a different viewpoint. And so um, I think it's important to bring them to the table so they can actually hear what the different issues and perspectives are. And that will actually um, help build a greater understanding and relationship and um, ensure that they feel included in what we are trying to achieve. And therefore, you'll get the greater support. And um, I just want to give a practical example of that. In my last role, um, I was trying to launch a mentoring program in my bank, 100,000 people in the bank, and we we're trying to promote junior women so that they could be um, have the confidence to advance to senior positions really quickly in a few years' time. And so I knew that it was really critical to get men to support this program because it was quite a hard thing to sell to say to all the men bankers, by the way, we're just going to promote women, can you help? So um, it was actually a lot of hard work going to all the different business team meetings of the executives and selling it to the majority of the committee, who mostly comprised of men. And we were able to share the insights and the benefits to the organisation, to the bank as a whole, for our customers um, and um, for the development and growth of our people and retaining the talent for all the money we spent. We actually got all the buy-in. So that's why I think it's really critical to make sure that you include men and explain to them what the issues are. Um, now, going back to Coral's questions, <laughs> um, in relation to effective policies for DNI, um, we don't want it to just to be a nice to have thing. Um, you know, obviously, leadership and culture uh, and, and tone from the top is absolutely critical. Your organization has to believe this and and breathe it, basically. There's no point in implementing a policy if you go about ignoring the policies um, and or, or you only follow it because I've got a bit of time to look at this now. You have a policy, then you should make sure that it's uh, well known and understood by colleagues of how the policy works and how it's due to operate. Um, and so everyone knows where they stand. Um, I believe that diversity and inclusion should be ingrained as part of the fabric of your organization. And again, that goes to culture tone from the top. And that, you know, I just refer back to uh, Jane's great models and ideas that she was sharing with us earlier, where she said, um, equity, inclusion and belonging should be a part of your DNA. And only then will you actually achieve um, great growth, uh, enhanced profit, success, and most importantly, happy people. Because if people are happy to be at work, they're more willing to be themselves, relax, work hard, get the stuff done, 
uh, be happy in that working environment and want to, to achieve success for the organization. And that just goes back up the line to culture, tone from the top, DNI. Um, so importantly, I think um, it is important to give the right messaging and communication to the organization. I think people need to be kept, you know, kept informed. The messages must be consistent and regular. And there must be follow through by action. So if the senior executive are going to say, uh, we are going to do this, well, get on and do it. And then demonstrate to the people you've done it so they can have a faith and belief in you as an organization. And then they will follow you. And that is an example of great leadership. It's important also, I think, to get the infrastructure right. Um, you've got to ensure that you have the right pipeline to ensure that the best talent doesn't leave. And if they do leave, you've got another talented person who has been, uh, you know, trained up and understands what to do to take over. And that would be the, the dream for your organization. So I think it's really important to um, ensure that you send the right messages and, and communicate this to the, to the people. Um, it's really important, I think, to uh, have visible leadership um, and, and demonstrate that support um, for people. And one of the ways you could do that is for the HR team to actually put something so basic as a checklist in place um, to demonstrate that they have followed through uh, with, um, with appropriate data. So it might be something as so simple as um, when we are doing job interviews for applicants, we will ensure that um, you know, we have a, um, a percentage of X being these people or gender or, or, or you know, people with disabilities. So, and then we can demonstrate that we've done this and we've considered it. So it makes it look like fair and equitable opportunities for people to come into our organization because it's such a great place to work that um, we treat everyone really well. Um, and so then HR could then collect, collect the MI and the data and share it with the Exco. And the Exco can then critically examine the results and uh, the results can be, sh can be shared at the board level to make changes, um, you know, recommended by your Exco based on the data you receive. And in that vein, I think it's also important to hear from the people on a regular basis, give them an opportunity to have their voice heard um, about what's working, what is not working in these policies and processes and the diversity and inclusion in the culture, because you want to have happy people in your organization. So, uh, you know, I would encourage an organization wide survey um, to ask the people honestly, what is working and what is not? Because if you don't know what's going on, then you can't make the changes to make the people happy. Um, and then communicate uh, the results honestly to the staff and then say, this is what we're going to do about it. And that way, I think you will build trust and uh, demonstrate inspirational leadership. So um, there's just a few thoughts, <laughs> Carl. Thank you so much. That's great. I really appreciated that. Um, I don't know whether people can actually um, type in the chat. I just thought I'll mention that to I think it's um, Stacey from Hill Dickinson's because it says it's muted. So if people do want to type in the chat, um, that's absolutely fine. Um, we're, we're very welcome, very much. Um, well, oh, you can. Fantastic. Someone's just put that in. So very um, much open to questions here or if people would like to ask them themselves. They can also put their camera on and unmute themselves. If you could raise your hand, probably a good idea. Um, and do bear in mind it's being recorded, though. So if you want to do that. Um, thank you, because I think this was like a, a kind of whistle stop. Um, tour, wasn't it, of um, Jane starting off with the, the kind of the overview of what it is that we're, we're dealing with, Jonathan talking about some of the practicalities in the workplace, um, and Leslie talking about how to lead on it. And, and I think this issue of ensuring it's kind of, um, I, th I think you said not only uh, having a policy, but get on and do it uh, is so important because there's often that gap, isn't it, between policy and action that people find really frustrating. Um, I, could, could I come back to you, Jane, just to ask whether you've got any further, I mean, if you, you've been working with different companies on how to embed uh, practices. Do, do you have any further comments on that? 
Yeah, I think I'd just like to echo, I think, some of the points that, that Leslie was making, I think, in terms of Leslie's presentation, coming at it from a, an organisational perspective, and I was coming at it from an individual perspective, you know, how do you um, see your, your voice? I think when I'm um, working with, with, with companies, um, those companies that, that come to me and to other consultants are clearly open and are you know, actively seeking to make change. The 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 piece that they struggle on is the how. And that's why I was saying we can have these amazing policies. I think Leslie, you talked about your mentoring program and, and it's okay to write a mentoring program, but the how bit is how you get that that senior leadership buy-in how do you then communicate it? How do you then know that it's working? How do you then evaluate it? So the writing almost feels the easy bit, you know. It's it's the how bit. So when I'm when I'm working with companies, I really try to connect with them and understand where they are on that journey, what communication systems they have in place, what type of an infrastructure they've they've got in place, and I really try and focus on who the end user is. So that end user is your your employee and the range of intersectionality that they bring with them just in terms of coming into the workplace. So that's always my focus. So I say, OK, that, that's great there. So how's that going to impact that individual at the end of the day? And how are you going to know that individual is able to not only access, but to enjoy what it is in terms of um, diversity and, and equality and inclusion and in particular belonging. Belonging is really my focus um, and sorry to go on a bit but I also think that really does link to some of the points that um, Leslie was making. It's the belonging piece and once people feel that they truly belong to an organisation then they can truly bring their authentic self and the range of wonderful skills that they've got and acquired from outside of the workplace and here's an idea organisations employees are happy to share and bring their skills and knowledge that they've gained from outside the organisation but actually you have to tap into them first you have to do that. So that that's the approach that I take. But I very much work with who that organisation is and where they are at. If that's okay, helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to one of the uh, questions in the chat box. We've got a couple. I'll, I'll deal first of all um, with one about tokenism. And mm. it says, have any of you encountered this? For example, noticing that a business has stated that they play he place heavy emphasis on EDI, but in practice that isn't seen. And maybe they have, they can say, I know Helena Kennedy often says this, that in the old days when she was in chambers, people used to say, oh, women, we've got one. Um, so that kind of tokenism thing. Is that something that, uh, who would like to tackle that one? I ask Le Le Leslie, is that something you'd like to talk about first? Well, um, I work in a Nigerian bank, so <laughs> it's a uh, very multicultural in my organization. Um, what I will say is um, for all banks, I think, generally speaking, I think um, the regulator, the banking regulators, the FCA and the PRA have focused very heavily on DNI and in particular, what they have said is that we would like to see more women on your board, more women in your executive team. I'm quite lucky. We're 50-50 in my executive team uh, here. So it's really balanced. Um, and, you know, at the board, we have um, a female um, a board director as well. Um, but you can see that the regulator is actually requiring all organizations to look at this uh, focus and focus on it. And you could look at it and say, well, you know, um, are they only just hiring someone uh, just to fill the quota at the tokenism? But the reality is if you you've got to start somewhere, and if if you if you're not having women on those boards now, then someone is now an authority is going to say, we want you to put a woman on the board or two or three. And once the women get on the board, and they establish themselves and demonstrate what great benefits they can bring to the organization, then it will become eventually normal to actually just 
hire someone based on their talent and not on their gender or or their ethnicity. So I think, um, you know, I think that steps are being taken now um, in my industry to make sure that we get that balance right. And I think that's a positive thing because you've got to start somewhere. Thank you. And and Jonathan, I know that um, you're in private practice. I know that Reed Smith have been very involved in a number of initiatives. I mean, is, is this something, I'm not saying that Reed Smith have this problem, but is it something that you've seen in different firms or different organisations? Is it something that you've been concerned about tokenism? Yeah, I mean, I say in terms of um, in terms of my own personal experience um, at Reed Smith, I, I I don't feel that there's sort of tokenism there because there are fully sort of fought out and um, initiatives that have been invested in over many years and on all different forms of diversity. Um, you know, there's there's a there's a women's um, network, um, but there's also a multicultural network. There's a, a gen you know, gen network. Uh, LGBT, disability, um, various different forms, and and they've been worked for over several years, and and constant sort of interest in that. I think what you can sometimes see, as you say, is where um, it's perhaps an idea of lip lip service almost. I think people sometimes can describe it as, um, and a sense of sort of people needing feeling they need to be seen to be doing something. Um, I mean, it's difficult necessarily to sort of pinpoint, you know, one plate one company, but I think sometimes it can be sort of having that external commitment in marketing, for example, that's then not followed up um, further. Um, and so, you know, I can remember when I was, you know, applying for for um, training contracts, for example, I was really struck that Reed Smith did uh, was was had held events for particularly for disabilities in my experience, um, although they also hold them for, for, you know, women's events and others. Um, but it, it it was very much sort of having, actually having events, having people there speaking to them about, about this, for having adjustments in place, really thinking it through in comparison to some places who, you know, an FAQ, I think w w was the only place I could see reference to disability. And it, it, it was sort of something like, do you, you know, do you, um, are disabled people able to apply? And the answer was sort of yes, we very much welcome you to apply, sort of full stop. And that was it really. Um, mm -hmm. But they would obviously still be saying that we're very committed to diversity. But um, I think that sometimes that commitment, I mean, you can you can sort of see, you know, by looking at what they're doing, how deep it is. And also is, you know, um, as has been said, it's not just about diversity, but it's about equity actually feeling maybe people feel that they belong somewhere including them you know and all these different um different aspects which which go beyond just simply saying we've hired x number of people and, and really look at um at, you know firm cultures um what is what is being done really to make sure that people actually feel part of that organization and and also have that equal chance um, not just to be in but to also sort of reach the levels that they want and are able to do so fairly um so yes, I do think that it is a a concern. Um, uh, there are places, obviously, as I say, that, that very much do emphasise um, in, in in a very good way, and that's been my experience. But you know, we we always have to be alive to the fact that there are places that, um, uh, no doubt, maybe it's a less um, strong commitment as you would like to see. Thank you. Yeah, someone's put in the chat box that the Gazette this week has an article about reputation laundering. Yeah. Uh, so that would be very much a kind of trying to look like you're doing one thing, but not really following through in the way that all of you have been um, talking about. Um, no, before we no, leave I the I issue of tokenism, that. Jane, yes, oh, do you want to mention? Say, sorry, I was just going to say, can I, can I add to that? I think um, in my own personal career, I um, have felt that I have been identified as, you know, the token black woman or the token woman, and I'm wheeled out in front of uh, an audience to uh, display myself and my intellectual words. And actually, we we know when that is being done to us. And so quite often, for me, I think what we are fighting or challenging in that is this point of merit. I firmly believe that every post, every job that I have gotten has been on the basis of merit, what's internal, 
to me, not on the basis of how I look or on the basis of my gender. So quite often in organisations, I found via my own experience, it's that that you're you're then battling. You know, I'm here on merit. I've secured this role on my merit. I bring a wealth of knowledge and experience that I'm happy to contribute. Please don't just be superficial and look at how I physically um, present to the organisation. And it kind of goes back to what I was saying before. It's that how piece, you know, but also it's this thing of there are there are some things in an organisation that should be non-negotiable. Um, using your people in organisations as tokens is a non-negotiable. <laughs> Thou should not do that and you should focus on merit and what that individual is bringing to the business at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you. That was brilliant, Jane. Thanks to all of you. Really good contributions. Um, if I could go back, this is a question specifically to you, Leslie. Somebody's asked about the EDI work. How do you measure the success of your work within the business? So I'll, if you could give an idea, I, I, I guess it's meaning, you know, how do you know you've actually been successful? Um, so I suppose okay. <clears throat> All right, Carol, thank you. Um, so I'll go back to that work on the mentoring. We, we had 15,500 people on the programme by the time I left the bank. Um, so it's quite significant. And the way we measured it is just taking the points that Jane was making before, really great points about how do you implement the, this idea that you've got. And so I'm really a great fan and supporter of listening to the people, hearing what they want, because it's what they want that you need to adapt. So I feel that I'm giving, I'm providing a service to you. So how can I serve my goal and help you? And so what I did was you know, in a nutshell, the how was I organized a mentoring um, event and I invited senior executives from my bank, um, men and women at senior executive roles and opened it up to all the women saying, who would like to come along and experience an opportunity to do one to one mentoring, um, speed mentoring uh, with drinks to start with to a relaxing atmosphere. Great law firm host. Thank you very much for supporting us. And um, the law firm would come and mix and mingle for drinks. And then they would let the women swap and go and do the mentoring. Quite hard work for the mentors. But you know what we managed to do? We got senior executive men and women who these women, who would the mentees, would never normally have the courage to go and say hello to or have access to. So they had 10 minutes with every mentor and they were able to do reverse mentoring. Here is my problem. I can't advance or I can't get access to this or I don't know how to do that. And, you know, I don't have the confidence to do this. And so they were getting this great mentoring from senior executives. And at the same time, the senior executives were learning what the issues were, which goes back to Jonathan's point about how do we, um, you know, relate to each other so that we can understand what the issues are. And then <clears throat> that massively grew. And as a consequence, I would always go back to the women saying, how did you enjoy the event? What do you think we could do better? What do you need? And they would give us this feedback. So on the feedback, I would then change and develop new programs and new events and invite everyone to come along. And so I was so busy every evening um, doing my day job and then in the evening running these fun events with all these women, which is very social and a lot of fun. And, um, and then after that, I went on to develop a bank-wide competition into different regions. As Lloyds Bank is a massive organization. I cut it up into eight parts. And I basically went out and got sponsorship for like eight Fortnum and Mason hampers. And I got all the women to mentor, to, to nominate mentor of the year within their own region. And then I got a senior executive in the bank to be the judge together with the law firm who was generously sponsoring for these hampers. And so we just got a massive um, intake of, of people filing mentoring um, competition um, forms. And I would also do a newsletter, which would go out uh, every quarter to everyone, highlighting all the issues that were going on. And, the, and then we would actually focus and highlight on success stories. So the point about success was these women, suddenly you see women advancing like changing jobs and getting more senior roles and it was becoming like a big thing and so we would just feature these women here's this woman this is what she's done and she would tell her story this is what happened to me i came back from my maternity leave and it was so difficult no one would talk to me and so we developed a program to make sure that we bring the women back and make sure they feel comfortable and kept informed about things going on to make them um, make it easier for them to return to work so it's all these ideas 
which were generated as a consequence of learning from the women. So it's really important to listen. And um, as a consequence, um, we had some of the men actually complaining that they were getting these roles because women were getting priority. But the reality was what was actually happening is that you now have competition. Whereas before, the women didn't have the confidence to apply for these roles because they only had two out of the five attributes required. And then mentoring would help them say, no, just try it. And then say, I can adapt and I'm sure I can learn from this. And so they were suddenly getting these jobs. So, you know, we have the metrics for that. We measure that. We got the MI and we shared the data. So I hope that helps. I think that's a fantastic answer. I think uh, the two things that occur to me listening to you um, say that, uh, Leslie, is one is funding uh, for these sorts of things. And I know lots of larger organisations now do have specific departments dealing with EDI because that sounds as though a lot of it was uh, depending on your voluntary work in the evenings in addition to your day job. Um, and the other is data. Um, I think if you don't, you have to attempt to collect something in order to be able to measure and show progress and so on. And J Jane, could I come back to you on that? Just what, what do you advise your clients when you're talking about embedding policies? Do, are there systems for recording the data and recording, measure, measuring what change has taken place? Yeah, I, um, again, as I say, try and work with um, the um, the the organization that i'm um consulting with and look at what internal systems they already have in place sometimes the problem with d um i b e is that if you start to increase the costs too quickly and 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 too vastly it becomes a turn off for the organization and if we're saying that this is core to your business it's part of who you are then your existing system should be able to either capture the base data that you need or it should be able to flex a little so go back and talk to your software um, developer and or provider to see if they can uh, develop an additional page for you. So I really do try to work with within their existing um, resources. Data is important because it helps you understand where you are so that you can set um, challenging targets for the future instead of just nice targets but it also gives you opportunities to measure as well a little similar to leslie though i'm i'm absolutely a fan of getting close to the source so i'm a fan of of speaking to individuals so i encourage organizations to think in a more qualitative way as well so i ask organizations to in fact to set up what i just call listening groups where you know uh, a strategic lead actually speaks to people who are affected by a scheme and initiative that you've put in place and to see how that, that scheme or initiative is working through the lens of that individual that is incredibly powerful the data is great because it can tell you how many and it can tell you when it can it can tell you all those process things but actually in this space what you're really interested in is the voice of that individual and sometimes that it is the challenge how you get somebody to leave their safe space and to move into someone else's space so that you're able to hear their voice that i found to be the challenge and sometimes people are a little nervy about that so that that's been my approach yes there's that quantitative data the numbers but the real powerful stuff is via those qualitative methods that, that you can develop and design in an organisation. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you. Um, the, what I think we should do now is I'm going to move on to uh, a question that I've asked each of the panel members to think about for us. And it's really to, to start bringing the, the session to a close. Um, and it's to ask each of them what one thing or action would they like us all to take away today? So it's great having all these people listen. And I know um, that the conversation uh, can be really interesting, but it's quite nice sometimes to come out with just this is one thing that I, I really do want to do differently or, or to think about. 
So I'm going to go to each of the panel members in the reverse order of how they spoke. So I shall start uh, with Leslie. What, what one thing would you like us to, to take away? Um, I think um, what I would say to the audience is to that I would recommend that you make the time for yourself and join a committee or a network which will give you the opportunity to grow your network, build your contacts um, and, and, and develop uh, so that, you know, if you had a question in law and you weren't sure about it, you could reach out to your network and find out the answer or what was going on in market practice, which is something I do in the GC community. Um, but I also think it's not just joining the network. I think you should actually take the extra step to make a proactive contribution to that network or committee, um, as, as demonstrated by what Jonathan and Jane do, um, because not only will um, it help you to develop new skill sets, but it will also help to build your confidence, like speaking confidence, um, getting out and doing things and having the courage to um, you know, share your experiences and you can only have experiences if you actually proactively participate, not just turn up to the event, but even volunteer to say, can I join the committee? Now, the Law Society, I know, has, does these, um, have these different committees. Um, you might think about joining one of those committees in the near future because it's our legal profession and we want to, um, to, you know, to enhance it and build it and grow and support and contribute back to it because it is such a great industry for, for all of us as you know, in, in the law. So I would recommend you do that. Thank you very much, that's great. Um, Jonathan, you next. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think the, you know, the really importance of equity um, and indeed of diversity, um, belonging in an organisation, inclusion have been really sort of emphasised um, and particularly on sort of Women's Day, the sort of in, in, impact there and in, importance uh, for women across um, workplace and society. I think in terms of one of one sort of takeaway, it'd be great for the audience to remember um, is those you know the the, the, the fact that a, a lot of the barriers people may face, the difficulties they may face, um, although they will obviously impact on particular um, people and, and those particular backgrounds, often do actually in their own ways affect multiple different. Um, people in multiple different communities in, in, in maybe in slightly different ways but still work that overlap so you know as I discussed with flexible working um, may well be a, a gender um, issue but also a disability issue um, and no doubt um, will impact others as well and so remembering um, uh, to see that to see where others uh, may be different from you in, in certain ways but also will have shared struggles um, and you know you can actually collaborate with them or maybe um, in those the diversity inclusion work that you know Les has just been mentioning um, and sort of explore those areas for collaboration and actually um, even where they maybe have um, difficulties and barriers that don't affect you you can still uh, support them through advocating for them and being a good ally to them um, in that way so that's what I'd like to leave you with. Thank you. And and Jane, what 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 action would you like us to take away? Yeah, I, I'm very pragmatic and and action orientated. So this is from a position of self, and it's think about that one percent change that you can make as an individual. Um, as a I part of my presentation, I was very clearly saying we all have an understanding now of what these key terms are. So I'd ask people to um, reflect, look at what it is that you're going to continue to do, what is it you're going to stop doing, and what is it that you're going to start doing. And that's that 1% change. That's all that's required. And I'm just looking at how many participants there are. If we all looked at 1%, it's shown that there's 67 here. Imagine if there was a 67% change in an organisation on the basis of each of us just making a 1% change. Thank so you. I think that's mine. a fantastic suggestion. And it is so true that we don't all have to be doing it, working on it all the time, or even as hard as Leslie obviously was at one stage at Lloyd's uh, to, to really make a change. I would say uh, in terms of the networking and 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 
finding out about other communities. I've put in the Legal Women uh, website because we do have a page on communities there. And what it is, it's uh, different uh, groups throughout um, the UK, so including Northern Ireland and Scotland. We still haven't got a complete list. So if you have additional ones you want to add to that, do let us know, um, because the idea is both that there should be national um, groups and Legal Women is one of those where you can join a talk like this and so on. But it's also, I think, really important to have smaller groups where you can really relate to individuals. And obviously you will want that to be in Liverpool, in Manchester, in Edinburgh, wherever it is you have. And I, I, so I'd really endorse as well this point about having a, a good quality network. So thank you very much again to all of our panel members. We panel members really enjoyed it. It was a fantastic discussion. Thank you. And thanks also to Hill Dickinson and to everyone who joined us. It's brilliant turnout. I'm really, really pleased with that. Thanks then. Bye for now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.